大家好，晚上好，欢迎大家来呃参加咱们今天晚上的分享会啊、呃。我们这个期间应该还会有更多其他的听众朋友们加入我们。那么我们现在就即将准时开始，然后呢，我会用咱们 meeting 的前面十分钟五到十分钟左右来做一个简单的自我介绍，以及介绍一下我们 Enlightened Future Foundation。那么之后呢，咱们就会把时间给到今天的分享人啊，我们的 student guest speaker 施瑜啊，非常欢迎他。之后他会做一个简短的自我介绍。那么，哎，那么我们现在就即将开始。OK， 好的，首先呢，给大家介绍一下，我们 ETF 的全称是 Enlightened Future 啊 Foundation， 我们中文的直译呢是启迪点亮未来啊这个基金会。然后我们主要的初心呢，是为了搭建一个专门属于学生们自己的平台，能够让他们啊更多的。去发声，更好的去发声，更多的把他们自己的经历以第一人称的视角分享给更多的同龄人们啊，因为我们很多时候可能是从各种各样其他的渠道或者是媒介来得知咱们的消息源，那么有的时候呢，未免会呃感觉到有一些繁杂或者是有一些乱，那有的时候可能没有办法听到咱们亲历者们啊这个非常真实的、非常 authentic 的这些分享，所以我们希望搭建好这样的一个平台能。能够邀请在各个领域非常有建树的我们的青年学生们，然后呢来锻炼锻炼自己，同时也作为 guest speaker， 作为一个小的前辈，去更好的引领后辈，去更好的把这些信息去分享出来。那我们能够啊，让更多人去获益，能够 benefit more people。那么我们现在的活动形式呢，是固定每两周一次，我们会在周末的晚间的一个时段找到大家，然后呢来进行我们的线上讲座。那么这个我们是希望啊，可以 long term 的去做，可以更长期的有这样的一个 exposure， 更多的和大家见面。然后同时呢，我们的活动形式实际上是非常丰富的，不管是跟升学相关的，还是课外活动相关的，或者是兴趣爱好的培养上啊，呃，跟学术挂钩的，或是呃择校啊，个人案例的分享啊，啊、呃，我们有很多很很很多各种各样的话题啊、呃，我们会。通过这个每两周一次的线上 meeting 的这样的机会，能够更多的和大家进行交流。那么我们的本质呢，就是希望能够一起共同的来创建学生帮助学生、前辈提携后辈的这样的良好的生态。那么我们同时呢，也是非常非常着重于学生领导力 （student leadership） 的培养的这么一个环境。我们呢，所有的同学在。负责啊、呃，这个分享的时候呢，不管是从初期的选题呀、啊、定题呀、啊，包括他们后期自己的这个全程的沟通，已经分分工协作，直至最后的结果的呈现。那么我们每一位啊、呃、学生的 guest speaker 以及参与者都是在全程的有一个非常全方位的一个锻炼。那么我们目前呢，也是在啊、呃、广泛的吸纳人才，我们希望能够找到更多志同道合的啊、呃、这个年轻朋友们。然后大家呢是希望能够更多。的锻炼自己的 leadership， 我们在这边写到，如果啊有兴趣加入我们的话呢，可以扫描下面这个二维码，或者直接给这个邮箱啊发邮件。那么三个，我觉得最重要的核心的优势，第一个是可以真正的得到学生领导力提升的机会。那么第二个呢，是可以成为站在非常的非常前线，为广大的学生群体发声的这样的踊跃积极参与的一员。那么第三点呢，是可以啊，在这当中结识到更多更 robust 的 find 啊，或者是 bonding， 能够和更多志同道合的朋友们，大家一手，大家一起携手前进啊，然后。那有更多成长的机会，对，所以这边是另外的一个我们的 recruiting poster， 大家感兴趣的话可以浏览一下上面的内容，然后有这个呃 request 或者是有意想要加入我们的话呢，可以扫描这个二维码填写一个报名表格啊、呃，参与表格，那么之后我本人会与我们每一位的参与者来进行更多的一对一的交流，非常鼓励大家来参加，是一个非常非常好的机会。那么我们同时呢，也面向我们广大的听众朋友们、家长朋友们，有任何您感兴趣的话题呢，您都可以进行 propose。我们的孩子们同时也是一样的，呃、uh, ，anyone could be our next guest speaker。如果您在某一
个方面有很多的这个呃经验，或者是有一些非常好的经历，是你觉得分享出来可以帮到更多的人的话，我们非常鼓励大家都踊跃的来 propose 更多新鲜的话题呀、啊，或者是这个自荐成为我们下一期讲座的这个 guest speaker 啊，一切都是非常有可能性的。那么我们每两周与大家见面，所以持续性与连贯性这一点是一定的。我们之后呢也会呃、嗯、有更多其他的一些呃、嗯、活动与大家见面，比如说线上我们可能会有一些其他采访的环节呀，或者是更多学生案例分享的环节呀，或者是线下我们会有一些 info session 呐、啊，有有一些可能 Q&A session 呐、啊，或者是有一些其他的宣讲会啊。那么这些话题呢，包括我们的人选呢，都是非常非常灵活的。啊，最终我们的初心还是回归到我们原来讲的这个，希望能够有更多、更好、更真实的这样的信息传递给啊大家，然后能够更多的来 benefit 我们这个社群当中的每一个人。OK， 好，那我们最后呢，来给大家简短的 remind。下我们的 housekeeping rules， 我们后面的这个具体的讲座的内容呢，更多的是会以英文来进行，然后咱们全全程的这个 webinar 是会录像的，录制之后呢。咱们会在二十四小时之内上传到我们官方的 YouTube 账号，所以如果您还没有关注到咱们 YouTube 账号的话呢，之后呢，啊，欢迎您来 subscribe， 然后我们所有的这些内容都是在上面可见，并且您可以更多的这个呃回看呐、啊，或者是与亲朋好友之间分享啊，然后让同样需要这样信息的人能够得到这样的第一手的信息啊，欢迎大家去关注时常的回看。那么我们讲座的框架呢，最后的十到十五分钟是预留给 Q&A 的。所以，如果我们的这个听众朋友们在讲座进行的过程当中有任何的问题，您可以先打在我们的 chat box 里面，然后我们会在最后十分钟左右来进行一个线上的 take up。好。然后，嗯，在这期间呢，同时，如果说咱们在啊切换成英语的时候，有任何家长朋友们或是学生们需要有这个字幕实时翻译这个功能的话呢，您可以点击屏幕中间的 CC， 我们有一个这个实时字幕翻译，并且是呃、啊、这个 detection 的这么一个 button。如果您点了的话呢，不管是英文的也好，还是中文的也好，它会进行实时的翻译。那么，如果这个功能对您是有帮助的话，您可以把它打。开有任何的问题啊、嗯，像我们之前提到的一样，您可以在我们的 chat box 里面给咱们留言，然后呢，我们看到了之后就会啊积极的来帮助您回答这个问题或者解决您的问题。OK， so that should be it. Um, and I will stop sharing for a moment so that we can see each other a little better. So in the meantime, I think there will be more people joining us shortly. Uh, but we will begin as we uh, previously planned. So Shu, you can unmute yourself and then um, do a little bit of the self introduction. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Shu. Full name Shu Zhang. I'm currently in、uh, grade eleven, and I have come a long way in terms of、um, trying to practice for the SAT. In fact, I have started prepping when it is like. Early August last year, as when I started to、uh, recite some of the key vocab, and since then I've constantly been doing practice and such in order to better my skills for the SAT. And I have taken the SAT or DSAT for that matter once online, ah,、uh, for the one in March. And on the first score, um, I got was fifteen forty, and that being said, seven eighty on the reading and grammar section, and seven sixty on the math section. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, thank you for all that great information. I know that now is kind of the time that a lot of people are starting to prepare for their SAT, um, or are pretty much getting ready for the one that is coming in next month and then the one um after. So, well, starting in. Kind of, let's say, late September and throughout October as well as November. Those are some of the peak seasons for、um, SAT takers to take the take take the test. So,、um, as for you, all right, we'll just right get into one of the first things that a lot of people. I think need to know about is、um, the value of SAT learning because many are thinking that SAT is merely more of like a standardized test. 
um, and all the effort that go into the SAT learning and, and prepping it is just for it a matter of the test. But I would um, very much appreciate your insight on what do you think, or um, based on your experience, what seems to be the real value of SAT learning? And she you can go on and give us a little bit of that, please. Well, in my personal opinion, the value of the SAT in general is not just about the skills of reading, grammar, and mathematics in the future. It's also learning about the valuable skills that are not specified to any category of study. This could be anything from time management to attention in detail, because the SAT isn't just simply just grinding repetitive questions. It's about finding the best solution and uh, time constraint to solve potentially confusing and complex problems and it just also tests your patience in mathematics and reading because you might not get a res desired result at first but you just have to be resilient enough to pull it off that's right yeah it is a time restraint and time sensitive test and it has taken a lot of people a lot of time to prepare but i think it's awesome that you're bringing out um, to the very front that preparing and or the whole learning and journey for SAT is, at, um, in fact, to go into benefit a lot of people in the long run, instead of just for the matter of, let's say, school applications or um, submitting that to particular schools that are interested in having them. So having that particular mindset of knowing that this is going to benefit you in the long run would, in fact, make the learning journey much more productive. So the next one um, is, is about, well, it's kind of like a hot topic, which is a lot of universities, if not colleges in the U.S., are adapting um, their test optional policies. And that is, in fact, well, happening for the, at least the last couple of years, um, given the pandemic situation. So under that prevalent um, test optional policies, what is there still a necessity to take SAT, given the fact that a lot of people um, and a lot of schools are saying that, okay, like if you submit it, we'll take it um, and we'll take that into consideration. But if you don't submit it, it it's fine. If you're saying that, should you in your stance, um, what would you say in terms of the necessity of still learning and, and preparing and, and taking the SAT? Well, in my opinion, although many universities have considered the SAT optional at this point, in fact, many, a lot of Ivy schools are doing it. For example, Columbia University has just done it, but it does not make the SAT any more or less important. I feel like the biggest reason that is often overlooked about the necessity of the SAT is the fact that it gives an unbiased image of your academic ability. Because if you think about it for a second, you might have a teacher that's at your school right now who adores you, or you might have a teacher that absolutely despises you. And you those personal feelings, because you know your teacher and your teacher knows you personally, and when they might have some positive or negative feelings towards you and they might slip in an extra few marks or scrape off an extra few marks when you weren't noticing and knowing you will introduce bias into the equation of your academic ability and the SAT on the other hand are marked by people that have no idea who you are other than your name they haven't met you they haven't spoke about you they don't know what your favorite color is and the thing is about that is that when there's no bias involved the score is your score because the professors that markets they don't know who you are so the, with that in consideration they won't care like what kind of a person you are they are just there to do their job mark okay. the test to see how this guy's doing mm -hmm. and i am in conclusion i feel like the biggest reason why the SAT is still important is because it gives an unbiased indication of your academic abilities right Absolutely. I think that that is very accurate. Um, it is a true reflection of how good you are. And on top of that, many, if not all universities and colleges, especially the very selective ones, they evaluate a lot on how a student is able to do and how well a student is able to perform under stress. Well, in that sense, we speak about time restraint right that we're having any in the SAT so with limited time how well you're able to do and it is a very prestigious and of course a very academically challenging test 
in general. So absolutely true. You don't have a bias. You go into the test and then that is just it marks as how you get marked. Um, and in, in that regard, um, I think this is something that is worth thinking about when people are considering if or not you are going to get into that SAT learning journey. And another thing is we will look at something that we need to keep in mind of. Um, if people are considering universities outside of the country, um, largely in terms of UK or um, US in particular, that test optional policy a lot of times speak to domestic students and it applies to domestic students but for people if not most of our applicants who are going to the states as Canadians or Canadian PRs or as international student then um, showcasing in your academic prowess through a non-biased and absolutely standardized test globally recognized is still very worthy and necessary. I think we've answered that question pretty well in a very informative way. So going on to the next one. So let's say she, you, you are the one who's taken it and there are a lot of people that are just like you who've taken the test. So based on your observation and your overall experience, what would you say that are some of the good signs that SAT has given you? Well, so does it help in terms of your academic competency? Well, certainly. There are direct and indirect factors when you're talking about it. For example, the direct effects are definitely in certain improvement in your core subjects like mathematics and reading. Um, how, why I think it's really special, how I think it's really special is that there are a lot of indirect influences as well because it also influences your writing positively because a huge aspect of writing is your sophistication because there's a lot of vocab memorizing involved and it Trust me, like once you study for the reading section, your vocab, like sophistication greatly increases. That way you can write, that way you can better for the better your writing, which is another good side effect. It also teaches you a lot of general skills that work for almost any category. For example, your self, uh, your self control, your time management, your patience. It also teaches you a lot of fun facts about social issues or social sciences. Might introduce you to some fun stories in the reading section. So yeah, it also opens your mind up a lot to many different perspectives and different fields of study. Like it might that. also help you open up a route for you in the future. Who knows? Absolutely. I think that's a great point um, that a lot of people are just focusing on the test itself without actually looking into the test. Um, so many are kind of just going through a lot of passages or maybe um, brushing it through the reading end or other sections without actually further analyzing what's in it, um, let alone kind of benefiting from the content that it provides. And you're absolutely right in terms of saying that there's a plethora of great resources and um, opportunities to grow along with your journey of learning in the SAT. And um, just to sum it up a little, I think she has given us a great insight on how SAT is capable of providing us with a lot more enhancement over the hard skills as well as the soft skills, right? So hard skills would have been um, the things that we talked about like academic wise, it prepares you better because the test is difficult, it is challenging, it is pretty rigorous too. So once you've gone through it, you will learn a lot more academic, um, let's say little tricks you could say or some of the great strategies that you're able to apply to if not all of your subjects that you're learning at school but on the other hand it also prepares you better for time management and self-discipline right and have a better signs of control i think that is absolutely long-term benefiting too awesome so Overall speaking, um, should you like what would you say kind of would be the diff let's say the, the um, differences um, without SAT and with SAT? So let's say if we do consider taking the SAT, uh, what are some of the unique advantages other than the ones that we were just talking about? Are there anything else that you think that SAT is capable of offering that makes it attractive and necessary for tons of others to get into? It is also, I feel like that the advantages of having an SAT score is not only as, a, it's only as like what you've mentioned before, but it also is 
a token to yourself of your own like capabilities. Okay. It's basically something that like you can like constantly stick around you. For example, if you're in the future and you're having a very, very, very hard task and you could just look at back uh, your SAT score and reassure yourself, if I can knock this out of the park, I can knock this, knock, th knock that out of the park as well. So, so this is like also a personal reminder to you. It's kind of like a trophy if you like get a high score. Mm -hmm. And so the SAT is not just some like stepping stone to like get into a good uni. It is also like a like checkpoint in your own life in a sort of way. And something that you could kind of look back to and see how far you have come. Yeah. And as I've mentioned before, it is an advantage because it shows an unbiased solidly solid assessment of your academic ability absolutely yeah so it also tests um us to our limit or you can let us see just how good we're able to be um if we are under the right direction and if we're following into instruction if we're doing everything properly this is just how well um we can perform and this is how far we are able to go so absolutely there are some very interesting and, and especially i would just say some long-term benefit and advantages that sat has brought along that can really help us become better selves um, and that is not an exaggeration or an overstatement. So up until the next part is that you are a pretty high achiever and we will be pretty interested in knowing a little more of your experience and your um, strategies going in there. So let's say, well, you introduced a little in your self-introduction that you began preparing in last August, right? So that's kind of just a little over a year. Um, so what would you say throughout this year of learning and preparation, what has been something that has worked very well for you? And would you recommend that to us too? Um, well, if you want to go generally for like all the different sections of the SAT, I would definitely, definitely say it's not about what you get right. It's about what you get wrong. Mm -hmm. So what this means is that you have to find out what stuff you have constant trouble with as soon as possible. So you could constantly go chipping in those areas and constantly like improving those aspects until like you got the hang of it. It is, I cannot stress this enough. It is severely important for you to find out what, uh, what topics, what passages and what equations you have trouble with early on. And that way you can find out what you have trouble with and just fix it as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just having that habit developing and yeah. uh, so sort of just foster this mindset very early on they need to focus on what got you wrong instead of um feeling very good about yourself of getting some of the questions right because we would want to maintain what you're getting right but on the other hand check all of your blind spots right i mean if you're ignoring or not really checking certain questions that you got wrong you probably will make that similar if not the same mistakes again which is totally not worth it, right? Um, that's great. We appreciate it. But, um, okay, so next one. Throughout your learning journey too, like what would have been something that you wished that you have known a lot earlier? And if that um, happened to be something that you've known earlier, it could, would tremendously help us grow other than knowing that we would need to tune into things that got us wrong. Aside from that one, is there anything else that you would recommend people make sure that you're checking that out at the, if not very beginning of your learning journey? Honestly, I wish I would have learned how to tackle the reading section more efficiently because it was really time challenging and time consuming to tackle the questions at first because the passages are very, very long in the regular SATs and you have to like constantly look back sometimes, especially for certain questions that asks you like your reason for choosing the answer to a previous question like you might get both of them wrong if you don't be careful enough so you also have to figure out how to save time because a lot of sections are going to take longer than others you have to also have to learn about what you should manage it how you should manage the time in the passages or categories that you have the most trouble with because those are the ones that you can get stuck most uh, and also quick rule of thumb don't spend too much time on one question. Trust me, it's not worth it. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. So that absolutely is kind of like a golden ticket for like it would work well for all kinds of standardized tests out there, especially if you're getting into like multiple choice situations. And I think that is absolutely a rule of thumb that if you feel like you're getting stuck with one particular question, just simply knowing that there are a lot more questions coming in and you would at least want to kind of scroll through all the other questions to know what like what's the rest and what do they look like? Um, that'll be like a reaffirmation instead of spending all of your time locking it there with one particular question. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think um, honestly speaking or objectively speaking and reading is indeed one of the ones, like one of the sections that are harder to get quick improvement on specifically under a short period of time. Because um, most of the SAT preppers um are nailing in the math section um uh, we've known personally a lot of students who have gotten just 800 out of 800 like a perfect mass mark um so that is something that people find a quick fix to however reading is a lot more different maybe sure you can talk a little bit about that later on but um absolutely as he has mentioned and indicated that early on, you would want to make sure that you focus on what makes you weak so that you will be able to develop targeting and strategies, just tackling that and making sure that you're being very effective throughout. Absolutely. So um, moving on to the next one, still regarding um, your master learning tips is, did you establish or have you identified a particular learning pattern throughout your learning journey like what's your routine and if oh. you don't mind please share us um like share with us a little more of that tips on your end all right so there's one very very efficient tip that stayed with me throughout my whole process it's called a run and repair process it's basically constantly doing practice tests in fact you should do a diagnostic test like regardless of where, how, how your academic abilities are before you start really studying for the SAT, because it generally assesses where you got wrong. And then like using the run and repair process, you constantly have to run constant tests to see which parts you're kind of like not doing so well in, what parts you're doing well in. So you can folk to decide how to chop up your time in order to do the parts that you're not good in. So the run and repair strategy is really good over the long term because it gives you more time to like make sure you're one hundred percent um prominent in all of the different categories of passages, mathematical questions, and how it could go down. Yeah, absolutely. So having a systemic run first so that you kind of check your bugs, right? You know what got you wrong and what are some of the weaker sections. Um, and I think that's extremely helpful if it's just like giving in like a full check, um, the diagnostic one. And that kind of test exists for that particular reason exactly. So you would want to make sure that you sort of run it through once so that you see what are some of the sections that could possibly drag you down. So you make plans, right? So in general, I think what she has pointed out to us is that you would want to make sure you have a very systemic and a targeting plan overall, instead of just kind of rushing through the practice tests without even knowing what's in it. Um, we always say one thing that you want to play a game well, you will want to know the rules first, right? Um, we've known that kind of like one of the misconceptions for a lot of SAT beginners or SAT learners is that they would want to, um, like they prefer self-study, which is nothing wrong and that can totally work out well too, but that does depend on different types of learners. Um, so overall, what we're trying to emphasize here is to make sure that you know yourself well, first of all, know your abilities and know how that sort of ring against the overall rules and the sections of SAT. So you know how the test is designed, how it's made up, and what are some of the commonly asked question types and what sort of trick do you want of time so that you're able to tackle them directly, effectively, and of course, productively. And that would really help, right? Based on Shu's um, experience and his observations in particular. Awesome. So moving on to the next one, I would really want to ask if for people who are in lower grades now and who might uh, think and taking the SAT in the future, so for the beginners specifically, what would be some of the friendly and very heartwarming and suggestions that would be very practical for them if they're just about to begin their journey? Well, if you're just going to start beginning your journey in the SAT, there's two, usually two things that you must do. 
for the read section, since you're going to get into some very sophisticated vocabulary, I definitely, definitely recommend you that you should definitely take start memorizing SAT vocab. There's some very, there's a lot of resources online about very important SAT program, SAT vocab, and there's a lot of like lessons and tests you can do on Quizlet as well. But if you want a really reliable and free resource that not only gives you practice questions, but also videos explaining different kinds of questions, I definitely recommend Khan Academy. And the best part is it's completely free. You can sign, you can sign up and in order to save your progress. And you can do those questions over and over again. And they'll always explain what parts you might get wrong. And they'll also explain the different question types. They also cover the DSAT too. Sure. Yeah, yes. uh, right. Absolutely. So do some research online. I think that's, of course, one of the first things that all SAT prospective learners should have been doing. If you haven't done that already, then start looking into um, the tons of resources that are there online that can help you at least to get like a little snapshot of what the test is about. Um, know a little bit of the history, know a little bit of the um, current let's say, version of the SAT that are available to be taken and then see which one would fit you better. Um, so knowing a little more of the test itself absolutely does not hurt. And there are free resources online, right? Um, the Khan Academy SAT prep course, as she has mentioned before. So I would encourage everyone to check that out too. Awesome. Great. So now let's talk a little more of the timeline, right? So the overall time that it takes to really just soak in all this important knowledge and then learn the skills, sharpen them, and then eventually nail SAT and, and be a high achiever. So um, how advanced, in your opinion, should, you, should students begin preparing the SAT? Okay. Honestly, honestly, the earlier, the better, in my opinion. But if you have a general proficiency in reading uh, and a math around like in early high school level you can start prepping from anywhere as early to like grade nine levels of knowledge you can start preparing and start reciting the vocab mm -hmm. because you need a certain level of degree of proficiency in order to understand certain mathematical concepts and for reading but you can start prepping as early as like grade nine right yeah and um we oftentimes would also encourage um, our vast STEM populations to begin just as she said, as early as possible. We don't, it, like it's not rare for us to see grade A students starting to just dip in their journey, uh, beginning and you know, learning in DSAT. And ideally we would really recommend um, people have their satisfactory score taken or achieved um, before going into grade 10 or um, in a grade 10's summer, that would work out too. And why would we say that? Like grade 10 would be like a milestone stage for you to sort of get the SAT done is because people would get progressively a lot easier in their grade 11 and grade 12, um, let alone of a lot of people who are ambitious in taking the AP courses. And that one would take a whole year as well to prepare because many people are aiming at a five in the May exam. So grade 11, grade 12, you would probably participate a lot more in school. Um, we're outside the school. People have different passions and different extracurricular activities to commit to. So things will get a lot more competitive and increasingly more rigorous as we go above the grades. So grade nine, when high school just began, it's, it's a great time that you still have a lot more flexibility. You're still making your academic um, explorations as to what interests you, what seems to be something that you are enchanted to and you would want to give it a try in the future. So that's the time that you still have more of the leisure time or you would you would have the time that you can commit to something like SAT learning. And so try to do it as early um, as you can so that you're able to achieve your satisfactory score by grade 10 or before you go to grade 11 so that you are actually making time for um, your grade 11 and grade 12 responsibilities, which a lot of times can be pretty heavy. Okay, um, yeah. So next grade, I would, I just individual 
sort of like more of like an interview for you. So you is that what does your preparation look like? Now we know that it, it took you a year or so, but did you chop it into different stages or how did this year go by? Um, did you progressively get to something new as the year went by? Just give okay. us a little bit of that, please. Okay, so my total timeline had like three general stages, early game, mid game and late game. So early game is where you start to like really start digging into the contents of the SAT and also very importantly, assessing your current capabilities. So I cannot stress how important this is right now because you need to know how good you actually are before you actually start preparing. Because if you don't know how good you are, you don't know how much you should get ready. And in the end, if you mess everything up, it's not going to be good for you. So the er in the early game is where you start prepping your vocab sheets and start memorizing vocab. Maybe a little bit per day is very it works too like if you're like sitting on the toilet or on the bus to school <laughs> like just chip in a little bit of time in order to just, just to memorize one or two more vocabulary words you also memorizing some synonyms will also help you associate with them better and also take a diagnostic test the first test is one of the most important tests that you must take because it'll see where you are so that's early game taking a diagnostic test start flip generally flipping through the pages and seeing what content there's going to potentially be and memories in the vocab and now once you get past the early game now you're in mid game mid game is where you start to really start improving the polls that you have in your learning and looking at the different the different topics that you might have trouble with and started doing practice questions, whether uh, it's by textbook or Khan Academy or and watching videos on how to solve certain types of questions. So that is a mid game, this, which is a lot of preparing and a lot of like patching up your mistakes and learning about potential questions that are going to be on the SAT. And throughout mid game, time management is very important because mid game is usually the longest stage of your SAT prep in process. And now once you're past, and now once you're past mid game and now you're into late game. Late game usually comes in when you, it's like around two, one to two weeks before the test is going to begin. So where this is, where, and late game practice is also really, really important, but Here's where things start to work out a little bit different. Instead of trying to learn new strategies and techniques, which you should have done in mid-game, just start repairing your mistakes. Find out what last-minute mistakes you might make. Don't make them on the test. And all you have to do is to, every time you get a question wrong, mark it. Okay, mark the question, say why you got it wrong, and just figure it out. And while you're in late game, you must get those questions and just check why you get them wrong. Just make sure you don't get it wrong on the test. And on the day before the test, do nothing. Do nothing. Even if you do something, it's probably not going to help that much at this point, except for doing, except for getting a lot of stress. Right. And also one last thing, rest well before the test starts. Because yeah. if you're drowsy, even if you're like the smartest kid in your grade, a drowsy student, a drowsy genius is worse than a worse than a awake idiot, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Always get enough sleep. Don't lose sleep over this. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of people are get, getting that kind of uh, just nervous panic period, which we totally get in. I think everyone would just go through it once or twice or maybe more times at different stages of her own lives, um, which, which are totally understandable. Uh, but I think those are some of the very down to earth and totally relevant advice and suggestions that she has provided us with. Um, and throughout, right, as everyone has heard it quite well, that at least have like a progressive route ahead of you so that you know what are some of the important things um, that you would need to do. And speaking of that, she used throughout this kind of journey too, would you say that there has been some of the very milestone-like and key tasks that people should have achieved at a certain period of preparation? Can you maybe name some of those very important tasks that we need oh, to kind all of- right. 
So the first biggest test, the first milestone is the very, is like the very beginning of your journey. The first step you take is the diagnostic test. This assesses your abilities and it also, oh, this assesses your abilities. It also makes sure that you know what level you're at. And the second milestone, I would say, and this is more of like gradual steps is memorizing a certain amount of vocab because you need to memorize a ton of vocab because in the stories, I mean, in the, reading passages there's going to be some passages that are excerpts from like story for novels in the past and they might have some outdated vocab that might need a little bit more analyzing so get your vocab straight and another key task along this timeline is to is to like compilate all of the vocab that you don't know and this is also another tip like figure out what vocab you might know because there's a chance that there's a lot of vocab you already know you also want to just write the vocab that you don't know into like a book and just just look at it once you have the time and another task that you must do in the timeline is figure out and in and the stuff in the middle is usually down up to you like you might set up a task to like master certain categories that you have trouble with i'm not you i have trouble with comparative passages but that might not be you you might ace comparative passages but the thing is you must set your own milestones based off of the categories that you have trouble with other than memorizing the memorizing all of the required vocab and mm, taking the diagnostic tests the practice tests are also very important too. You should take one at least once per once per every two weeks or once a week if you have the time. And other than that, all of the milestones are up to your own ability and your right. own companies. Yeah, so there is a certain degree of customization that would apply to each or each and every individual because their uh, circumstances are a little different. But overall, I guess to just to put it in more of like a nutshell, that number one, make sure to take a diagnostic test as the well, the kind of like the first step of getting into the journey because you want to know how good you are and where you are. I think that's the most important thing so that you can make a plan for it and you know just a roughly about just how long ahead you would need to go through and then what will be some of the important things along the way and number two is to make sure that you're started to sharpening in your tools and I think one of the most important things that she has mentioned multiple times now vocabularies and I absolutely agree with that because it is very there's a plethora of different things that can come along the way so you would want to make sure that you're sharpening your tools um, you know exactly what sh what you need to expect um, in a test. So that is also very important. Number three, along the timeline, making sure that you are creating your own wrong question collection. That is important, right? So as she kind of indicated it before, um, you will not get into the questions that got you wrong and then got you confused and tricked you. So you don't want to make similar or the same mistakes ever again, especially not on a test. And number four, make sure that you're doing practices. All right, the practice test, the mock test, the mock practices, etc. So there are a lot of different ways that you can roughly more of like making it kind of like a simulation just to see how good you are in the real situation. So I think all of those are all very important things. So now let's talk a little more of the challenges that you've dealt with, as well as um, maybe a little bit of the personal growth that SAT Learning has bestowed you with. So number one would be, well, what were some of the difficulties throughout your whole year journey? Was there something that was spe specifically or particularly challenging for you? And how did you deal with it? Well, something specifically that was difficult me for me is the reading section because it's usually long and tedious in my opinion because usually the thing you're going to read about isn't something that I usually want to read. And the thing with that is that don't let that get you down. You have to still pay attention to like the details. You must be fully alert when like reading the whole passage. You can't like look you can't like doze off for one second and you'll just not read. Uh, that part and another little quick tip that i give you is to practice active reading instead of passive reading passive reading is just you lazily sitting on the couch reading a uh, john green novel or something like that and uh, uh, an active reading 
on the other hand, you are fully alert, you are fully ready to scan the contents and noting the important aspects of the passage that you're reading. So practice active reading while you're practicing the reading section. So yeah, the reading part is really, really hard for me. And I overcame it by watching videos on Khan Academy. Really try, you should definitely try Khan Academy. It's the saving grace. And <laughs> you should also, you should also manage your time and also tackle certain questions that require you to trace back on the reading section because um, so some of the passages you have to like read first, look later, some of the other parts you have to look first, read later, and you have to decide like which is which. And some questions on the reading sections are simple. For example, it might ask, what does this word mean in the context? Other times it's going to be hard. For example, like the author expresses either XXX when describing XXX. And that could require you to like pay very, very close attention because one little detail could either fully confirm or knock down your answer. That's right. Yeah. So I think overall that does go back and tie back to a point that we've been making this whole time, which is to get yourself familiarized with the rules, right? So what kind of questions are there in particular sections? What do they require? What are their expectations of me as a test taker, as a learner in general, so that you are doing the preparations that are totally targeting, which means they match with what you're going to see in a real test. And that, of course, helps. Um, instead of making the preparations that you believe is going to help, but in the end, or on the other hand, it's not really showing in a test or it's not that pertinent, um, that would be less of a fortunate or productive journey that we need to be mindful of. Awesome. So um, next one, so if you were to rate your overall experience um, out of 10, let's say, how much would you give, give it? And do you, or would you say that it is worth it and it is actually rewarding? Honestly, it is extremely satisfying, like at the very end, like once you get the score out of your college board account, you have the huge wave of relief. Like if you did well, it's like, finally, it's finally <laughs> over. I can sleep easy now, That's right. which you should, by the way. And <laughs> also, I feel like it, that moment of satisfaction is it feels really, really good knowing that you just accomplished something great and all that pain and serving that you went through. It was worth it. That's it right. was worth that idea. If you get a score like 50, 40, or even better, give yourself a pat on the back. You've earned it. Mm -hmm. And yes, I would definitely say it was very satisfying because it's like a huge checkpoint in your college prep career and in your life in general. And mm -hmm. no, and especially when knowing your percentile, you you've know that you've overcome like a certain percentage of people who also tried the same thing as you. So it also motivates you to do better next time if you haven't done well the first time because you're motivated to climb on the top of like very people because the college is that you want to get to only pick the best of the best of the best. So yeah, so it's definitely satisfying. I'll give it a 9.5 out of 10 because <laughs> I lost sleep, unfortunately, sometimes. Right. So that's and, <laughs> yeah, I would definitely say it's worth it. It's worth your future. It's worth your personal development. It's it's really, really worth it. That's right. Yeah. And rewarding. Yeah, yeah totally relate to the part that you said that you would have this huge wave of relief when you know the result and you know that this whole year it has come to a just a great period, a great end, and you've done it. And a lot of times so, um, it, it does boast confidence and it, it does help you understand how good you are and how capable you are in achieving something that is very difficult and challenging and for if not all types of learners out there. Great. Uh, okay, so now we're curious and asking to you, once you began learning an SAT, have you noticed that you are learning something um, new other than just how to deal with this SAT? Or like, have you picked up any new skills along the way that may be um, like outside of just the academic wise? Does it help you somewhere else? Well, if you want to talk like specifics, I learned paying attention to detail and cause and effect throughout reading the reading sections because it's mandatory to like pay attention to the passage if you want to do well. 
And time management is really important, like, throughout the whole thing, because you'll have to, like, balance your schoolwork with this as well. And if you have other things in hand, like APs or other things, you're going to have to juggle your time even better. Because what it hap what it does if you don't manage your time well and you're staying up until 3 a.m., everything just goes worse. Like, if you try to do everything and it doesn't... If you're trying to like do everything and you're not managing your time well, especially for those students who are like have extra programs outside of SAT and just regular school, your everything's just gonna go downhill if you don't work stuff out because losing sleep it just affects everything, your mood, your your current capability to do work, your attitude even maybe. So manage your time well, and. Don't lose sleep. That's right. Yeah, I mean, SAT kind of gives you that opportunity to really focus on things as it requires it to be mandatory. Or if you want to do well on SAT, you would naturally start looking into details, start become more sensitive of your time management um, as to some of the hardcore or just required aspects of doing well on SAT in the first place. So it does train you other than your academic skills or academic aspects. It makes you become a more disciplined person. Um, and it like the things that you're doing for the sake of training and for SAT will be proven to be very proficient and necessary for a lot more things in your life other than what you're handling in, in school. So in terms of that, so you, we know that it's a stressful process. It's a long process too. So do you mind sharing with us what are some of the things that you've been doing in order to relieve those stress and make sure that you're constantly keeping your motivation up? What are some of the things that you've been doing and you think is helpful? De-stress? Yeah, de-stress. And Well, the biggest way to de-stress yourself is just simply put, doing the thing you like, okay? It could be anything from reading to playing an instrument or if you hang out with family in general. Yeah. More because morale is also very important when prepare for the SAT. You need to keep your morale up so your confidence level stays up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't have one answer. That depends on you. What right. you enjoy is what will give you like your morale, which in turn will ensure that you'll get a really good SAT score in the future. So what I did is like I like reading a lot. So recently I've been reading like a couple of rom-coms lately and they really really helped me de-stress after a long day of work but don't let this confuse you with getting distracted don't just distra don't distract yourself too much don't spend don't don't go to 12 a.m just to play fortnite with your friends okay <laughs> it's not gonna work out i don't care if it's fortnite valorant league of legends Baldur's gate 3 just sure. don't lose sleep over like something okay right. just don't get distracted as well okay. but still so uh, once in a while, reward yourself. Keep your morale up. Mm -hmm. Keep the spirit up and then get going, right? Um, yeah. Have a strong start and then just maintain that edge throughout your learning journey. I think that's absolutely, absolutely worth mentioning. Okay, so we're close to a wrap here. And we have one question coming in now. So if anyone else has a question that you're curious to ask um, with someone as an expert right here who's capable of answering your questions. So um, have your questions coming in if you do have anything else that you're interested in. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you this one question that we have right now. What's the average length of SAT reading articles? So how long are the articles? Um, well, each article is one page long, not front and back, just one page long. And for the split passages, they usually half a page long. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, that is, some passages have graphs as well, and they take up a lot of space. So, but they're usually not that hard to analyze if you're good at math. Mm. Or you, but a lot of them require you to pay attention to the passage as well. So don't forget that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the passages are not that long there are usually excerpts right as um, she has mentioned before so a shorter version of something that's taken out from a longer or the original one however they are difficult um, in their own ways so um, and there are also 10 or so questions associated with each passage <laughs> Right. Um, and another thing I think is worth mentioning is that a lot of questions are having an interesting relationships with one another. So sure you kind of mentioned it before, if you get one wrong, you could get the next a couple of them also wrong. Um, so that would be like a kind of like a 
trick that the SAT designers are playing. So if you're not careful enough or you're not familiarized enough with the patterns of the questions or the ways of how the questions are asked, um, you could fall hard for that trap. So knowing in yourself, knowing the test, knowing in the rules of the game so that you're able to play it well. Awesome. So we're going to hang in here for another one or two minutes to see if there's any more questions coming in. Absolutely encourage them to come in as we still have um, she right here. In the meantime, I'll do a little bit of the closed remarks. Thank you so much for everyone who's joining in us tonight. And shout out to Shi Yu, who's been very passionate talking about SAT and his own observations, his great insights, and a lot more details that we're having in um, onto different sections of the test itself. And I think we're having some great information um, tonight regarding your SAT learning, and even like despite or regardless. If you're a beginner, um, if you're somewhat intermediate with SAT learning or prepping, or if you are just about to get your test done in the near future, I think tonight's webinar and sharing should have given you some great information and some great tips that you can work on, if not immediately. So last but not least, right, I would like to um, reclaim who we are and what we do. We are an incorporated not-for-profit um, NGO here in Canada. And um, what we are trying to do is just to provide the most authentic, real, and firsthand information from the students themselves to people who are just well, on a similar um, route or who are walking into similar walks. So um, we will meet with everyone every two weeks online. It was an interesting topic and anyone can be our guest speaker if you are confident of proposing something interesting. And we welcome anyone and everyone to come join us too. We're actively recruiting now. Um, so if anyone is interested, scan the QR code that we're shown at the beginning of our webinar and come contact me and I'll be more than happy to talk to more people who are like-minded, who are altruistic, and who are having a warm heart of giving something that you know to help more benefit. Thank you all so much and shout out to you again. Thank you for your awesome insight and we hope to have you maybe sometime soon in the future too. Ah, awesome. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Good luck to everyone's new semester. And I'm hoping that everyone is rocking it. Um, it was your best performance. So I will see every single one of you um, very, well, very soon in next two weeks. All right. So that will be it for tonight. Thank you so much. Right. And see you all next time. Right. Thank, you, Annie, thank you for such a great, great host. Great for having me here. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my personal experience with all these fun people. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all very soon. All right. Good night. All right.